Pester 5 Looking Back and Forward Pester 5 was released somewhere in May 2020 and it, it brings some awesome features. I want to show you some of them and I want to show you the main gotchas that you will encounter when you will start migrating to Pester 5 and then I want to show you uh, the new features that are coming in Pester 5.1 some of them are already released as a beta and some of them are not finished yet and are just work in progress so let's get to it the first thing that you want to do when you're starting with Pester 5 is to open your Visual Studio code if you use that as your editor and type pester into the settings which is a uh, control comma or you can find it in the option menu and then you want to go here and you want to unclick this use legacy code lens that will enable the lens that pester provides on all the items you can see that now we have run test on it and also on child describe let me go back and let me enable it again so this is the old mode where we only have run tests on those two items and then in the new mode we have it on all items so on context on it and on all items that are invocable so what we can do right now is that we can click run test either here and run all the, all the describes, even the child describes, including all the setups and everything. Or we can go here and we can run just this single test. What we can also do is that we can put a breakpoint inside of this test and debug just this test. So you can see that now we are on the breakpoint inside of this test. And you should also notice that all of the setups that are associated with this test also ran. So this way, it's very easy to just focus on a single test just by clicking debug test right here. And this works on all items. So we can click, we can continue here and we can go here and we can click run tests in here. And you can see that right now it takes more time because before that, when we just ran this one, it finished quite quickly because it saw that this is the test that will run and so we will only run the setups that are associated with that so that's this one and this one and this one but not this one because this one is in a child context and we won't be triggering that and this one takes a lot of time so we already saved three seconds on this invocation but if I go here and click run test on this item which is inside of context inside of this context then this before all will be triggered it will take three seconds to run and then it will run the it block right here so that's one of the things that pester 5 brings that it discovers the tests that are inside of file and then only runs what's necessary for them to be run like the setups that are associated with the test that will run The next pain point that Pester 5 removed is debugging of mocks. So let's go here and let's click debug tests. We start debugging and we hit this line, which will be invoking a mock that we defined right here. So up until now, there is no breakpoint hit because this one is inside of this script block and this one is inside of this script block. And we also should set one breakpoint in here. So I'm pressing Shift F9 to put a breakpoint inside of the line. So you can also find it somewhere in the menu. And then I continue. And you can see that I will jump here, check this parameter filter to see if emoji is equal to fire truck. And we can also evaluate that code. So we can do dollar emoji run it and see that it's empty. So this one will be false and we should be falling back to this mock. And that's what happens. So we triggered this breakpoint and now we should be returning fire. And so that happened. So this test ensured that the output of this command is fire and we did that. Now we go to the next one. In this case, we specify emoji 
uh, the emoji parameter as a fire truck. And so this test, this parameter filter should pass. So let's try that. So here the emoji will again evaluate and we can again try it in the command line because we are at a breakpoint. And you can see that now the emoji variable is set to fire truck. So fire truck equals to fire truck. And we can even run this whole line by pressing F8. And you can see that it evaluates to true. So this parameter filter will pass. And so this behavior will be used. So now we jump to the fire truck and we continue. And we can see that the second test passed as well because we are expecting a fire truck to be returned. So this is already a big improvement from version 4 where you couldn't really debug the mocks because setting the breakpoints here in the body or in the parameter filter would just not trigger the breakpoint. But this is probably not enough, at least not for me, because you have to understand how the mocks work. You kind of have to set breakpoints all over the place. It would be nice if it told you what will actually happen. And for this, there is an option. So we are switching to here, uh, to script number three, which has pretty much the same code as before. But one of the things that we want to do now is that we go into our settings and reset them back to the default that we had where if you install the extension. So I installed the extension and switched it here to detailed to be able to show the previous demo. But the default is actually here to be diagnostic and here to be normal. So let me switch this back to detailed because I want the output to be detailed. But this debug output verbosity will be set to diagnostic. And so this one will be effective only if you are debugging, not if you are just running tests. So we go back here and we set a breakpoint as we had it before. So here one, here we want another one. Uh, let's set a few more inline breakpoints. So here and here, again, it's Shift F9. And then we debug those tests. So you can already see that there is a lot of output that we didn't see before, and it describes what is exactly happening inside of Pester. And so here you see some advanced logs coming from the mock. So we just hit this line and we will be invoking our first mock. And so we continue and it tells you what's happening. So it tells you the get emoji was invoked from a block process uh, and then it's looking for all the behaviors inside of this scope and inside of parent scopes. And it didn't find any behaviors inside of the parent blocks, but it found two behaviors locally. And those are the behaviors. One of them is this one with this filter, and the other one is this one with no filter at all. And it also tells you that it's running this filter without any context. So let's see how that evaluates, because right now we are at this breakpoint. So we continue. And... Uh, it says that the filter didn't pass. So the emoji wasn't set because there is no context. Context means the variables that were passed inside of this script block. And so this is the default behavior. We will be choosing that and we are executing it. So now we get the fire and we continue to the next line. So it also tells you this one was executed. And we are on the next line, which will have this emoji fire truck passed in. We again look for behaviors, found two of them, and we are now evaluating again this filter. So now it tells you that the filter passed. And here also you can see that the emoji, the context is that the emoji is fire truck. So this emoji is the variable emoji and fire truck is the value that was passed inside of that variable. So now you can see that the filter passed and so this behavior will be used 
as uh, the behavior of the mock, we will be invoking this fire truck. And we continue, we again returned it correctly. And in this log, we can see exactly what happened inside of the mock. An alternative way of setting the output is also this pester preference, but we didn't use it right here. But you can find more about it in pester readme on github slash pester slash pester. So this diagnostic output is to me like the best function that we have in the in pester 5 there is many new features and if you navigate here to github pester slash pester and scroll down you will see the readme for pester 5 which describes all of the new features that you might be interested in so i definitely recommend that you go and look at that and read through it and see if there is anything that you could really use so now for the breaking changes so there's quite a lot of breaking changes that were introduced in pester 5 some of them were necessary some of them are just to make the whole syntax and the whole approach better and work better with the discovery and the run so first of them is that the legacy syntax is gone so if you remember you could do this should and be without any dash and that's not possible anymore so if you run the code like this it will tell you this legacy should syntax is not supported in pester 5 and then it points you to this migration guide so this syntax was removed in pester version 3 and uh, it was recommended to migrate to the new syntax when you move to version 4 and now in version 5 it's removed so there is no replacement for it and you just need to fix your script and if you look at the migration guide it even provides you with a regular with like a regex that you can use to change all of your script at once so it's pretty easy then the change number two is that all your setup code should now go inside of before all so before all you might already know from the describe block when you are providing a setup but in version 4 it wasn't requested to put all the code inside of there but in version 5 you should put all of your code all of your setup code and all of the code that would normally go here in the body of describe but not inside of it you would put it in a before all block so this is how your test would be looking in version 4 probably and then if you migrate to version 5 this is how it should be looking so your setup this part shouldn't be using this old here with my invocation my command path because that doesn't work anymore in pester 5 duh don't get me wrong this works but it just doesn't work together with before all so a much better way of doing this is to use ps command path or to use ps script root and um, use that to navigate to the file that you want um, there is this blog post that i wrote that describes all of this in a detail and describes what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing um, and why so if you are interested go read that then this moves into a before all block and we replaced it with just a simple line and then this part which is also inside of the body of describe will move into a before all block so it would look like this and that's pretty much the main breaking change that will probably require you to change most of your tests if you didn't follow those rules before but it's also a pretty easy change to make um, if you look at this 5.0 release script uh, not release script readme then somewhere here there should be a script that does most of the work for you as well actually if you go back to my blog
here is another blog describing the same thing, uh, describing what is the motivation for this, what are the changes that you need to do. And somewhere here, there is also a script linked that you can use to do this migration. The next change is that the variables that are in discovery are not available in run. So let's first um, describe what is discovery and what is run. Or let's first look at how this works and how it doesn't work. And something seriously break. Okay, so this is misplaced. So first, this would be code in Pester 5 that wouldn't work. So what happens right here is that during the discovery phase, when we are looking for tests, this part will run and this script log will also run. And this for each will run and it will generate tests using this it. But because we are only discovering tests, we are not running any of them, then a test is represented by this it function. So this script log will not run when you are running the discovery. And it will, it will not automatically take this fruit variable and associate it with this it block. So then when this test actually runs, when the script block is actually invoked, the fruit is not defined anymore. Um, this is a known issue and uh, there is some improvement in Pester 5.1 beta that helps to fix this, but it's an important thing to realize if you are generating tests that this thing won't be defined in here even though it looks like it totally should be based on the code itself. So one of the remedies that you can use is that you define a single item test case as I had before and you simply pass this variable as a test case because what happens is that it takes this test case this one will be associated with the it block with the whole test and then when the test is finally run it will see that here is a hash table that has fruit key in it and it will define a fruit variable based on this value so you are basically attaching it to the test and then automatically defining it again and everything will work just like this The next breaking change is that in module scope should be avoided in Pester 5 tests and should be replaced where possible with dash module name. In module scope is mainly used to mock functions that are internal to a module. And so it's much better to use mock module name to do that because then you are testing the public API of your module, not the internal API of your module. So let's look at how this works. So here we have a module that we just define in place and we call it M and we import it. And then here in the describe, we either use in module scope, which will run the tests in the module scope, or we use this dash module name, which will just define the mock inside of the module, but then run the test outside of that module scope which is much better because you are looking at the public functions of the module not the internal state of the module so we can see that in those cases um, both of the tests are passing because this is a very simple case but if you get to something more complicated it will get more complicated with the in module scope for example, if we put this into before all, it will start behaving very weirdly and the module won't be defined. And so it's then much more difficult to understand what's happening. So if you can, don't use in module scope because it makes the execution way more complicated than you want.
The next change is that should throw is no longer just matching the message with wildcards. It now uses instead of contains, it uses dash like, so the like operator, which will take wildcards, but it will not match by default. So with the alt should throw, you could write just this and it would match this error message because the condition inside said if this message contains this message but that's no longer true because then there is no easy way of saying i want this exactly or i want this to like just end with this message or i want this to start with this message or i want to this to contain the message so now internally it uses like so you need to provide um, the wildcards to be able to match the message so this works this won't work There's also a pretty big change in uh, connection to mocks. So mocks were always pretty difficult to understand. And uh, especially because mocks were defined inside of a whole context block or a whole describe block, but not inside of the it block that defined them. So this mock in version four would be effective not only in this it, but it would be effective in this whole describe. So a lot of the times you would have to go and define one extra describe block or one extra context block just to be able to um, get rid of the mock that was leaking into this second it. And that was pretty annoying and pretty confusing. So right now we scope the mocks based on the placement. So in here I have this mock inside of the it and so it will only be effective inside of this it block, but it won't leak to this it block. Let's try to run the test if it works. And it doesn't. One more try. Okay, now it works. So we run this test I, this function call was mocked, but this wasn't because as I said, this mock is only effective inside of the it. And then we have another example where we have mock inside of the before all. And this tells Pester to define the mock in this whole scope, in this whole describe. So when we run the test, this call will be mocked and this call will be mocked as well. So you can choose based on the placement where you put your mocks, they will either be effective only inside of the it or in the whole describe or in all of the child describes as well. The next change is also connected to mocks and how they are counted. So before, uh, because mocks were scoped to whole context, mocks were also counted in the whole context. So right now we also uh, scope them and also count them based on the location. So when we run those tests, we can see that all of them pass. And that's because we have this mock, which is defined in the whole describe because it's inside of before all. And then when we call the mock, the default will be that we are counting it as inside of the it. So we are in an it and because we are asserting it inside of it, we are only counting it as uh, we are only counting the calls that happened inside of this it. So in this it, we called it once. Inside of this it, we also called it once. So this passes. But in version four, this would fail because it would say it was called twice because this would be the first call and this would be the second one. But we can also override this. So we call it for the third time and now we want to check in the whole describe scope and that would be exactly three. So this is the first one, second one and the third one. And then also inside of the after each we can check. So after each, after each is running in the scope of it. So we are also counting it as if we would be inside of this it. 
so this will check was there one call in every it and that's right so one 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 so after each of those tests finished this check will also run and then the last one when we are asserting in after all no idea why would anyone ever want to do that but it's consistent so there were three calls in this whole describe because after all is running in the describe so this should help you a lot to clean up your logic and your scoping inside of your tests because what i'm trying to achieve is that you are shaping the tests in the way that you want and not in a way that you need to work around limitations of the testing framework So the next change regarding uh, mocks is that you should be using should invoke instead of assert mock called. So there is a new function called should invoke or a new operator for should and it replaces this assert mock called. So when we run the test we can see that both of them are still available and both of them work uh, the same way but this is now the preferred way to be asserting on mock calls should invoke. So those are most of the breaking changes that were introduced in version 5. There is a full list of all the breaking changes hopefully on the bottom of this readme. which is here and then there is also deprecated features and additional issues that should be solved in the future so if you find new ones please report them so we can put it on this readme and categorize them so other people don't have to guess if this is just broken or if it's already a reported bug or if it's uh, intentional breaking change that happened in between the major releases of the framework. And now when we are done with the breaking changes, we can jump to some new features or some features that uh, are catching up with the previous behavior that we had in version 4. So one feature that was missing from version 5 was passing parameters to the test script block, uh, to the test script, sorry. And uh, that's now fixed. So what you can see here is that we have this passing parameters and here I'm just putting the script inside of a script block instead of what you would do, put it inside of a new file. And this is just for me to make it much easier to see and uh, do not fiddle with multiple files so this by itself would be just a file and you would have this param value this is something that you might want to do if you have um, multiple maybe machines that are required to have the same specification or if you have multiple sets of data that you want to provide to your to your uh, pesters tests to be able to test different, I don't know, different sets of the data, like different machine configurations or different files and so on with the same sets of data. So here we just provide this value and I'm just gonna write out what the value is from this setup and then check if the value is greater than one and less than two. So if it's one to two, and then I can pass this data. So I'm using this new uh, commandlet or new function that's called new test container. And it takes either dash path or dash script log. And then it takes the data. And in here you can provide an array of data. An array of data would be array of hash tables. Or you can provide just a single hash table. And you can provide this new test container as many times as you want. So if you have one file with multiple sets of data, you have the option to either pass this as an array to a single test container or pass it 
as uh, one set at a time with this new test container and just point it to the same file. You can also pass multiple files with multiple different sets of data. So the combination are pretty, uh, pretty extensive and it really depends on how you want to approach it. And then finally, I just do invoke pester dash container C, which is this, this thing. And I just select output to be detailed to be able to see what's happening. And so what it shows me is that I'm calling this twice, once for each value. So in the first call, the value is one, which is coming from this set. And then in this call, this value is two, which is coming from this data set. Um, if you don't like this API, you can also go and file a bug or file a feedback on the Pester, uh, Pester repo because this is released in Pester 5.1 beta 1 and beta 2. So there is still some room for API improvement. So if you have some feedback, feel free to either tweet it or put it on the repo so I can fix it before it's released as final. So this one was just catching up with what uh, Pester version 4 already had. And then this one is actually a new feature in Pester 5. So in here you can see that we have this new for each parameter that is on describe. And this one behaves exactly the same as the test cases on its. It multiplies this describe with the data sets that you provided. So let's see how that looks like. So the test finished, you can see that we have two ets, but we have four tests. So for um, each of those data sets, we run this tests once, these tests once. And so for Windows, we run those two tests. And for this one, we also run those two tests, getting four tests in total. And you can also put those in childs and so on, and you can use um, the templates as you could with test cases. So this is pretty versatile. If you want to generate tests, this is a better option than just using a for each keyword. Now you can also see that we can use this path in here and we can also use it in the child it block. We will get to that, uh, get to why that is soon. So the templating, uh, the pointy braces, uh, pointy braces inside of the names got much better. So you can also now expand child names. And I think I'm skipping ahead here. So this is probably a better option. Yeah. So here we could see that we can, instead of using for each around those its, we can pass the hash table in here, but we had to do some work to be able to pass the path and create hash tables from them. But in Pester 5.1 beta 1, um, you can provide any array with the data. So right here, I'm just passing an wrong file again. I'm just passing an array of two strings and it will still expand it. I just cannot refer to it by the path name because now it doesn't know how this would be called. And so I'm just using underscore which would be um, reminiscent of this dollar underscore that you would normally use to refer to the current item and so it will expand in here it will also expand in here and you can then also use it inside of the test so this was also heavily requested feature to be able to pass just any array as um, the parameter to for each or to test cases and it works in here and it also works on it so so here uh, we normally have test cases but test cases are also now aliased to for each and you could also pass any data to this one 
um, not any data, you can pass any array to this for each or two test cases. Now to the example that I skipped ahead to. So not only you can now pass any data in an array or in a hash table, you can also expand on them. So if in your array or hash table, there are data that have a deeper structure, you can use dots to navigate to them as you would in your normal code. So in your normal code, if you get an item that would be user and you would want to see the name, you would do dot name. And so you can do the same thing in this template. You just use the pointy, pointy braces and do not use any dollar. And so if we run those tests, you can see that this resolves to Jakob, it resolves also to my age, and also this resolves to Mathieu, my son's name, and uh, the age one. And we can check that both of us are less than 40 still. So we have two tests, we expanded it pretty nicely. And uh, here we are using both of the items from the object inside of the template. So just using this kind of template is a preferred way of expanding any name um, in this description because this now not only expands it from the data, but it expands it also from any variable that's defined in a scope. So we went for this one, and now we have a pretty complex example to go over in this feature one more time. So here is my list of scenarios, and this is a pretty complex object, but that's something that I might be uh, passing to my test script externally. And so I have this scenario one, which has name A, and those are the contexts that I want to have. And then I have sub scenarios called AA, and I have those examples for that sub scenario. And then I have this another sub scenario, which is called AB, and it has those examples. And finally, we have yet another whole scenario, which is called B, which has a sub scenario BB, and then it has this data. And so we would probably load all of this from a config file. It would probably be a configuration for something like uh, um, operation validation and or deploy, deployment validation or something like that. And we would pass it to a set of tests that would be then generating um, something that would describe if everything went right or not. And so what we can do is that we pass this scenario um, from the external as the external data to the script so this would be our test script and we would pass the scenarios as the data using the new test container that we saw before and then in here we expand the name of the scenario and we say generate one describe for each of the scenarios that we got so we, we should get two describes then if you remember inside of the scenario we had context and so we have those contexts here and this name is uh, just referring to this one because the current behavior of test cases is still persisted so if you pass any array to this one it will expand to the dollar underscore but if the array is an array of hash tables then it will take each key inside of this hash table like the name and context and define it also as a variable. So here we are passing scenario. This scenario is a hash table and hash table has two keys, name and context. So now we have two variables, name. We are not using the variable name anywhere, but we are expanding to it in here. So as I said, this template has now the ability to expand to any variable and this is a defined variable. It's also a key inside of this. So we have the data available. And then this one, because this is a hash table, is defined also as a variable. So we can use it here in the for each to expand to it as well. And so here we are passing contexts. And contexts are, again, 
an array of hash tables or just a single hash table. So each key inside of that will be again expanded to a variable. So again, we define a variable name and we define variable examples. And as you can see, we are again using here examples to expand the it. And we also use this data from the examples to get this template to expand. So when this runs, we will take the examples and examples are again a hash table. So a hash table defines this user variable, which will hold this object. And then we expand to it. So we grab this username, user age, and then we assert on the user age to be less than 35. So this seems pretty complex, but once you understand the structure and what you want to generate, this is actually pretty easy to read. And then we just take the original data associated with a test container and invoke it. So let's do that now. And you can see that we generated tests for each of the scenarios. We have the scenario name expanded here. Uh, the context name expanded here and then we generated single test for each of the tests, each of the its. So all of those tests passed and we can use this to just externally provide data and generate tests from it without using the for each keyword and without facing the problems that we would normally get with the for each keyword. So those are the main new features in Pester 5.1. And there are a few more fixes, uh, some connected to VS Code, some connected to just general problems um, that were overlooked in the initial release. And hopefully the 5.1 release will be done somewhere before December or before the new year and will be released. But I'm uh, regularly uh, releasing betas so now we have beta 5.1 beta 2 and there should be 5.1 beta 3 pretty soon. And now looking even further into the future, here are some few possible features that I've been thinking on. So while working on, on the other talk with uh, profiling PowerShell scripts, I came across this library called Harmony and it enables me to replace .NET methods on objects. So um, .NET methods and properties, because properties are just methods, but they are a bit special. And so I'm thinking about using this to provide uh, mocking for .NET methods to pester, and with, it would probably allow you to do stuff like this. So you would have date time now and you would replace the call to this with your own value, which would be probably pretty nice. I already posted this on Twitter and wanted some more feedback on it to see what people would be using it for if it's really worth it to invest some time into writing this down. Um, here is some gist where you can try it out. It's pretty complicated and maybe a bit complex but you can see how it would be used or how it uh, how it works, not exactly how it would be used because the API is pretty terrible. In the future, if we really invested time in this, in this it would be integrated with mock or maybe come as a separate module with some sane API that can be used. Then uh, again, working on the profiling, I saw that it could be used for uh, code coverage, much faster code coverage for Pester. Actually, that was my main motivation to start looking into this because uh, without that, uh, without that, the Pester, Pester code coverage is super slow because we are using breakpoints and uh, using the profiling API would be pretty much the same as just running the code without code coverage. And the last thing, we are working on improving our documentation. So on httpspester.dev, we split the documentation into version five and version four. Version four is now no longer maintained, at least the documentation. 
so if you will go to this site and you see something that is not true for powershell uh, for pester 5 please consider helping us uh, improving this documentation uh, you can either go here scroll down click edit this page and then propose the changes in here or if you have some changes that would be for this command reference you would have to go to pester repo and find the appropriate command and change the inline help in there for this to be uh, propagated to the site. So if you are interested in helping us with the documentation, definitely get in touch because this needs a lot of, lot of help. And with that, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please reach out. And thank you for listening.